Good evening. Welcome to the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting of September 19th, 2016. Can we uh, have the roll, please? Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Spring? Here. Mr. Walker? Present. Mr. Cange? Uh, present. Mr. Spinelli? Here. Ms. Barker? Here. Mr. Strike? Here. Ms. Bailey has been excused. Thank you. Thank you, and I would like to note for the record that Mr. Sporhase uh, was here at this meeting. Um, I'm told by staff that he's been alerted to the fact that he has uh, reached a number of absences, which means that he's to be uh, removed from the commission. Um, Mr. Sporhase disputes that and would like to resolve whether or not an attendance at one of the meetings counts as a, an absence or not. So I just wanted to state that he was here today if, in fact, um, we're not going to use this meeting as an absence, but they'll they'll come back and tell us what the determination is if he can continue on or if that if he's made met I can't remember what it is Terry eight absences or whatever it is. Okay, so moving forward, uh, disclosures, Mr. S uh, Spring. I have none. Greg. I have none. Brandon. No disclosures. Tony. No disclosures. Andre. Uh, yeah, I'd like to disclose that uh, there's a, in the case 2016-0010, uh, amendment to Title 21, uh, I believe that members of the Home Builders, uh, the Home Builders Association consulted with the municipality on some of these changes. I'm a member of the Home Builders Association and I may, I attended some of the preliminary meetings and uh, I also build houses which are affected by this code. So just want to put that out there. Any, any questions or discussion for Mr. Um, Spinelli? So uh, Andre, did you have a role in, in crafting the ordinance itself? No, no, I did not. And I think given that this is an advisory to the assembly, uh, I don't see that uh, I think you're I don't have an issue with you participating here, but thank you for that uh, disclosure. Um, I'd otherwise say that I have no uh, disclosures other than uh, I too uh, build, um, uh, work for a company that builds residential housing, um, but otherwise have not been involved in, in this ordinance. Greg, did you have a motion to direct Mr. Spinelli to participate? I do. And thank you. And I would vote in favor of that because I would be actually like to hear his opinion from that side of the house as well so I think it would be good very good thanks for the motion seconded by mr. Walker any additional discussion hearing none uh, mr. Spinelli is directed to participate in 2016-0101 uh, moving on to the uh, consent agenda oh actually the there is nothing on the consent agenda could we hear f uh, from staff on case 2016-0110 this is a um, request for time extension of an, a previously approved conditional use permit, and this item is not a public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, this is a request for a time extension of a conditional use to allow a gas station, a convenience store, and a B1A district. The conditional use for the gas station and convenience store w was approved by the Planning Zoning Commission on January 12, 2015. The petitioner's representative has included a copy of the resolution with the application. The petitioner is requesting a time extension com to commence activation of the conditional use. The public hearing took place on January 12, 2015. The resolution was adopted on April 4, 2015. And the conditional use will expire on a October 6, 2016, unless extended by the commission. I do want to point out that um, the petitioner's application had a different date. I believe they thought the, um, the um, conditional use would expire on September 9th, but I believe he was measuring it from 18 months from the date of the meeting, the night it was approved, whereas we date it from when the resolution was signed. So that's why it's a, approximately a month later. Um, the narrative states that Cook Inlet Marketing Group is not in a position where it can prudently commence development at this time. First, Chevron remains in the process of reconfiguring, reconfiguring its new remedi remediation system at the site. 
until the extent of that work is precisely determined, it will be difficult for them to efficiently commence development of its convenience store facility. And secondly, um, given the continuing uncertainty as to the continuing strength of the Anchorage economy, CIMG is somewhat reluctant to invest the required two and a half million dollars to develop a convenience store on the premises. Accordingly, a one-year extension of time until September 1st is respectively requested, that's of 2017, so that CIMG may continue to coordinate development with Chevron and better assess the state of the Anchorage economy. The department had no objection to the one-year time extension. Is that it? That's all I have, okay, yes. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Spring. Yes, I wonder if you have any information on the <clears throat> status of the site remediation issue. Uh, and, the, I, and I would just say that we're, we're going to ask the petitioner to come forward oh, as well. But. Well, that yeah. would be more appropriate for mm -hmm. them to discuss it. I didn't think it was a public hearing, so. It, I, I, we can hear from the petitioner, just not general public comments. Um, any other questions of, of uh, Ms. Ferguson at this point? Hearing none, I'll invite the petitioner forward. Good evening, Stephen Ellis, appearing on behalf of CIMG. Thank you. Uh, anything to add? No, I think she was quite thorough. So I'll ask Mr. Spring that he sounded like he had a question that maybe you can address. Yeah, uh, I was here at the la at the previous um, conditional use approval, and there was discussion about site remediation of the old gas station. And I wonder if you could kill, give us information about the status of that remediation. It. Uh, it's an ongoing process. Chevron is in the process of uh, redesigning the system and implementing a new system, and that's one of the things we're waiting on. My understanding and expectation is that that new system will be implemented this uh, coming. Mr. Ellis, can I get you to move the mic up? Please? Sure. Thank you. I anticipate that the uh, uh, reme new remediation system will be implemented this spring and early summer, and. Uh, it will help us in our development if we know where the new monitoring wells are and that sort of thing so that it will be easier for us to work around those structures as we go forward with our development. Uh, okay, yeah, I thought, for some reason I thought the remediation was already started. Well, it's been going on for quite some time, since uh, approximately 2000, but uh, oh. the, they're kind of taking a second look and approaching it in a different perspective now. Okay, thank you. Mr. Strike. Yes, thank you, and through the chair. At the time of the approval, when it first came before us, there were 15 conditions that were outlined and identified. Two of those conditions involved fencing the lot, um, especially in the southern portion where it faced the neighborhood. Right. And so understanding that the delay, you're, you're looking to delay the actual development of that lot is there any issue possibly with continuing at least with one or two of those conditions that were outlined at the onset of the rezone? That is to say to uh, commence, uh, you'd like to see us perhaps build the fence sooner rather than later? Yes. Yeah. I think we'd be, we're just, reluctant to make any more investment in the property until we're quite sure we're going forward. Uh, the uh, south portion is, well, the only activity on the uh, property right now is a uh, coffee stand that is right on DeBar, so the, the entire length of the lot going towards, I think it's Mink Avenue is undeveloped, so, and there, there are, uh, there's vegetation that's always been there that's immediately in front of the street there. So I don't think that there's a hazard or a, uh, an eyesore, if you will, uh, for the folks look at, looking at the property at the moment. Okay. Seeing no uh, other questions, thank you for your presentation. What's the will of the body? Uh, Mr. Cange. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In regard to case 2016-0110, I move to approve the request 
for a time extension. Thank you. That's seconded by Mr. Walker. Would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you. Um, I find that this um, time extension is in the best interest of all parties, uh, supported by the staff packet. Or, um, none of the conditions from the original uh, conditional use plan has been changed, and it appears that um, the prior owner is working on a better solution, potentially, to remediate the site. Thank you. Any additional comments? Hearing none, please vote. That time extension is approved. We have uh, three public hearings here this evening. Um, I'll start by reading the, the procedure um, by which the public may speak to the commission at the meeting. After staff presentation is completed on public hearing items, I will ask for public testimony on the issue. Persons who wish to testify will follow the time limits established in the commission rules of procedure. Petitioners, including all of his or her representatives, will have 10 minutes. Representatives of groups such as community councils and PTAs, five minutes, and individuals, three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the commission. An individual, an individual may have appeal rights relating to any action the Planning and Zoning Commission takes except commission recommendations to the assembly, which are not appealable. It's worth noting that the three cases that we have remaining on our agenda this evening are, in fact, recommendations uh, to the Assembly. So with that, case 2016-0097, Municipality of Anchorage, pm and &E, rezoned from R1 single-family residential district to I2 heavy industrial district. This is 19 acres, generally located west of C Street, north of West 100th, east of Minnesota Drive, and south of West 92nd. Could we have a staff report, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You've already given all the introductory stuff, so I'll jump right into it. This is a request to rezone 19.01 rezone acres from R1, single family residential district, to I2, heavy industrial district. The rezone is necessary in order to accommodate a stormwater sedimentation management facility needed by the MOA to comply with MS4 requirements administered through the US EPA. The MOA conducts routine cleaning of the stormwater infrastructure that includes catch basins and oil and grit separators. Both liquid and solid materials are collected and discharged into the wastewater collection system. Current facilities for handling and disposal of this waste are not adequate, and a search was undertaken to locate a new facility. The site was selected through a site selection study undertaken in, in 2015. The block, sorry, the lot located in the middle of the three lots is the petition lot proposed for development of the stormwater sedimentation management facility. The Clary family owners of the southernmost property, which is block four, lot two, requested the inclusion of their property as part of their request. In discussions between the planning department and PM and, and E, it was found that there was not a Title 21 land use category that described the activities that were to occur in association with the stormwater sedimentation management facility. As a result, the planning department has prepared a code in, amendment to add this land use category under the I-2 zoning district. The code amendment is, is, uh, will be later on tonight before the Planning and Zoning Commission. They will take up that um, zoning change code amendment. Um, looking at standard two, the parcel to the east of the subject to southernmost lots is used for industrial purposes. The MOA snow disposal site is located there. The northernmost subject lot adjoins two parcels of land zoned I-2 owned by MOA Heritage Land Bank. The Laurel Acres subdivision to the east is zoned R1. The lots were subdivided in 1970, and to date, none of the sites have been developed. Much of the sub subdivision has Class B wetlands, and development of the lots would be cost prohibited. Further, the attached map, which is in your packet, shows the number of lots that are owned by the MOA 
and a private entity with the intent to use these lots for wetland mitigation. And moving on to standard four, the property east of the petition site is zoned I-2 and is developed with uh, an industrial use. The property to the north is zoned R-1 and is undeveloped. If this parcel is developed as an R-1 use, the petition lot to the north, which would be block nine, lot two, will serve as a separation and buffer to the I-2 property. Looking at condition six, the three petition lots have class B wetlands. Development of the site will result in the loss of wetland on the subject lot. The diminution of the vegetation will affect wildlife in terms of habitat loss. Wetland function will also be impacted. PM&E recently submitted a permit application to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers seeking approval for placing film material on the property with the purpose of developing the facility on the site. PM&E proposes mitigating the loss of wetlands by conserving wetlands within the parcel directly to the north and thereby restricting future development of that northern parcel. Standard seven, the proposed rezoning will have negligible impacts on adjacent land uses as, to, as the rezoning of the properties from R1 to I2 is, con is consistent with current development patterns in the immediate area. Standard eight, both the 1982 comprehensive plan and the Anchorage 2020 comprehensive plan identified this area as residential. However, since the issuance of both those plans, it has been determined that residential use is unlikely to occur. The draft LU land use plan map shows the area suitable for industrial use. Although I do want to stress that the um, draft land use plan map is, a, uh, is only a draft at this point and is premature to make future land use decisions based on it. Uh, department recommendation, the department finds that the nine standards have been met and recommends approval of the rezoning of approximately 19.1 acres from R1 to I2. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson, any questions? Go ahead, Mr. Spring. Uh, yes, I have a question regarding standard number five <clears throat> for rezoning. And, uh, let's see, I'm looking at <clears throat> what page is that on? Excuse me a second. I think it's page five. Yeah, page five. Uh, the way that it's written, I don't find that the um, standard is met, um, my opinion. Um, there's certainly isn't any road connection to this parcel. Um, Arctic Boulevard isn't uh, constructed. It's a class one collector. And then you go on to say that an uh, access driveway will be built connecting 100th Avenue to um, the parcel. And if it's gonna be zoned I-2, I don't think that's adequate. And I think it's really, um, I know you'll, Maybe you'll correct me, I'm sure, but um, is the plan still to bu build a driveway or is the plan to build a collector on the right of way? Through the chair, Mr. Spring, uh, yes, it's a, that's a fair question, but I do want the commission to understand that this is a rezone request, not a major site plan review. And we all, once we have plans before us, tend to go off on a tangent and kind of really closely examine the site plan, myself included. Um, but um, yes, the plans have since changed. I believe they are not going to build a driveway at this point. They are gonna build a road to half um, standards, meeting half road to municipal standards. And um, the petitioner will um, have some additional information regarding the construction of 100th Avenue and their plans for that connector road to the proposed facility. Uh, through the chair, I, I understand that you're issue about the site plan, but this is a condition of approval. So when the commission reviews it, we have to be assured that it's gonna meet those standards. Um, a driveway, in my opinion, doesn't meet the standard. It's, I, I disagree, it's not a site plan issue, it's a um, zoning uh, standard issue. And I, would, I, would, I need to be assured that, from the petitioner, that what you said is gonna indeed be true and that this should be corrected in the, in the notes here that it's not going to be a, we aren't approving a rezone based on 
what's written in here regarding the driveway, but we're, we'll approve the rezone based on uh, uh, a full access, um, half access or whatever built to the property. Yeah, thank you. M Mr. Spring, could, couldn't you argue that, you, you know, as it exists currently, there's, there's, there's no facilities that support it as an R1 lot? That's true, but this is a rezoning standard. We're rezoning it, so it has to meet the rezoning standard, uh, regardless for, of. For an I-2 lot, how about for the actual specific use that's being Well, it would proposed. probably be required that um, if they were going to go for a building permit, you have to, I'm over my head here, but I think they would require um, a legitimate access, a full, uh, some type of half collector access. A driveway and a right-of-way, a private driveway and a right-of-way is not permitted. As far as I know, I don't know anybody that's a private development that's allowed to do that. that do you? Probably is true. I do not. Thank you. I had a question um, for staff on the the northernmost lot that's also, I believe, owned by the municipality. Is it, it says? I, I, could you restate? I think the use is that's proposed is for a uh, is a wetland use, right? Yeah, yes, you're, you're correct. Is That's there a correct. reason then why it needs to be part of the rezoning action? Uh, the petitioner might better um, address that concern, but I think um, since they owned it, they just thought they would go ahead and, and include it in I-2, but there is no plans to develop that lot. So it could go either way. Okay, I'll, we'll ask the petitioner. And the petitioner is the municipality, yes? That's correct. Okay. Uh, i got a couple other questions. Uh, Ms. Barker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you asked one of them. I, it seems to me that we actually kind of have two different things going on here, philosophically. Um, in some respects, this is kind of a technical correction to a zoning designation that probably never should have been made in the first place because the land is clearly not developable in an R1 mm -hmm. circumstance and has not, in fact, been developed. One question I have is when the inventory was done of the R1 land and developable land available for uh, for housing recently, was the site counted in that? Oh, that's a good question, and I didn't look into that, so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really answer the question. And I think I'm only asking that because um, if it has been, I feel we need to go back and make some kind of an adjustment to that estimate given the, the housing issues that we have to meet in our city. And I guess the other question I have is, it's, it's easy to kind of get con tied up in the proposed plan for what's going to go on the parcel. But I think in a more pure context, we really need to consider, aside from that, what really is the highest and best use of this land? What is the most suitable way to use this resource? Since obviously it did not turn out to be suitable for residential. And then secondarily consider the actual plan for what the municipality proposes to do with it. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Parker. Mr. Strike. Yes, thank you. The property to the west, that's current subdivision, Laurel Acres subdivision, is that currently fully developed? No, it's not developed at all. None of those sites have been developed so because of the wetlands issue. So none of those roads are currently in. There is a, it's that's totally, correct. That's what I thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strike. Any other questions for Ms. Ferguson before we invite the petitioner forward? Is that uh, who do we who do we have uh, from? Okay, come on forward. Yeah, just say if you're going to actually use the, we'll, we'll require that you stand next to the mic during your speaking point. So if you need something close, keep it close to you.
So if you could state your name uh, for the record and let us know uh, how much time you'd like to reserve for rebuttal. What's that? My name is Melinda Tsu, and I work with pm and &E. I'm a project administrator. And um, I'm going to try to keep it short to leave uh, room for questions, right. time for questions. So um, let's see, I have some notes here. Sharon covered it, most of the, all the high points. We're petitioning for a rezone of three lots. There, it's uh, the middle one is being proposed for a development. The, mo nor the northern one is um, uh, proposes conservation wetlands preservation, and the third one is a private property owned by the Clarys. I don't know if they're present here tonight. No. Anyways, they have not proposed any development that we know of so far. Um, well. The, the city finds that these, you know, this is in line with planning and the uh, long range planning use of, of these properties to be um, um, rezoned from residential to industrial. Uh, let's see. This is a. Uh, I'm going to need you to be on the mic or it'll be all off record. Okay. So. This, that map here shows the uh, proposed Anchorage Bowl land use plan map, and that does show these three parcels as resident, um, as industrial. And, um, but one thing that I did note when I talked to planning is that this map actually shows land use and not zoning. And it, so the, the, adjacent site to it is a um, the snow disposal site uh, so it's another complementary use that we are you know proposing as far as the proposed site um, <clears throat> something to to point out about the access uh, the city is working on the development of 100th Avenue extension and it's going from C Street over to Minnesota and um, <clears throat> our access we did talk to I'm working with John Smith he's the project manager of this project and we did meet with private development recently to talk about access and so the current plan is to um, have a half width standard road construction um, off of this 100th Avenue extension but what we did talk about too is the vast majority of all these properties to the north um, beyond our site are undevelopable lands and right now they're wetlands and there's no you know proposed uh, development for them so to carry the road all the way through private development private development had supported maybe a lesser standard after you get some type of access to this property that maybe a lesser standard would be acceptable. But again, they said that those details would come out during a, a, a building permit review process. So. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? <clears throat> Mr. Spring, go ahead. On 100th Avenue, is the intersection with uh, Arctic uh, full intersection? I don't know exactly what's proposed. Pros I mean, uh, rather, it's not just left, um, right turn, right in, right? It's can you make a, come down to a um, hundredth and make a left turn? I believe so. I think there's going to be a median, and the median won't go so far here. So yes. Um, have you thought about? asking for if you're not going to if the city doesn't think that it's really necessary to extend Arctic all the way through have you thought about amending the um, OS and HP to eliminate the class one collector 
No, we haven't gotten that far. We, we haven't thought about vacating any right away. But you are thinking about reducing the, uh, the design standard on a certain part of that extension. Potentially. Which would not meet Potentially. The I mean, class there's one collector, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know if this is actually shown in the OS and H&P right now. It is. Is it? All the way down there? Yes. Okay. The entire Arctic is a class one collector. I'm, I'm not sure. So, okay. just, we've just had preliminary just discussions. Simple. One thing to note is we're only in concept phase for this project. I mean, we're just in soils, you know, we've had some preliminary soils done so far. Uh, we're gonna do some more geotechnical work this fall. Survey, we just uh, got a contract for the surveyor to go out there. We're doing all our kind of background, uh, uh, you know, class, classification of, of the materials that we're expecting to come to the site. Basically, it's going to be a dewatering site for all the materials that we remove from catch basins and um, to support the, you know, our requirements for um, our, our permit requirements. Thank you. A couple other questions, Mr. Cange. Thank you, through the chair. I noticed that you went out to the Bayshore Clat Community Council. I didn't see any letters of support or um, not <laughs> or the adverse. Um, did you go out to uh, to Katnu or Taku Campbell Community Council? I didn't see anything in the packet. We did not go to that one. We only went to the Bay. Do we know Clatt, this in their um, privy? I see they're on our our packet as being on there to Taku. I, I think this is, I don't know. I think it's only from what I was aware of, it was only in the Any, Platt, Platt yeah. Bayshore Community Council. We did make one presentation there. Okay. Did they have anything to say adversely or? Uh, they did not say anything specifically against the rezone. Okay. Of course, they were more concerned about, you know, if they were to build their future house next to it, but that. Just that the, out of everybody that we sent notices to, there was one couple that did show up. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Walker. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, um, so this is being called a stormwater sedimentation management facility. So does that mean you're going to suck all the junk out of the storm drains with a vector truck and then you're going to dump vector trucks on this site and pile up dirt? I mean, is that really a, is that a, layperson's description yeah, of what's going to happen yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And, and I think sedimentation got in there somewhere, but it's actually just sediment, stormwater sediment management facility. So my understanding of how this works is they dump the truck, they push it into a big pile, and the water runs out of it, and it, so you're just, that's really what you're doing. Then. Yes, this is essentially we're dewatering uh -huh. the, 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 the gr grits and gravels and sediment that we remove from the catch basins and the manholes and... Will they remain on site indefinitely? Or no, no. So base? this is just a, a site to process and dewater the materials. And um, what we're actually looking for is like a tilted, a very, very uh, gradually tilted uh, concrete slab. And, you know, with, you know, slotted drains and various, you know, we, it, again, it's just concept. We, we've actually looked at different facilities around, like, 11 facilities down in Washington State to get an idea how they, you know, they, how they have set up a site like that. They actually have, like, a canopy, open canopy cover, like a pre-manufactured building canopy cover. But, yeah, but, yes, it's simply that type of process. Once the materials are dewatered, we would, again, gather them and haul them off to the landfill or another, you know, site that accepts materials. So uh, a lot of this work, uh, my understanding is it's done, there's a private contractor in town that does a lot of the work for AWW, and then I think AWW has some of their own trucks. Will this be only for AWW trucks, or will it be for the private contractor? That's a really good question, because this is really just for street maintenance. So AWW at King Street has their own facility that can handle septage and sanitary sewer waste. We're exclusively looking at only handling, you know, non-domestic waste. Okay. Mm -hmm. Currently, there's there's a, there's been an opportunity for us to use the AWW site. 
um, for, you know, it's, it's certain times we, we um, discharge the, the water into their system and then we have a different place that we've been managing it at North, Northwood. Okay. But yeah, it's not an AWW facility. So uh, you can probably see where I'm going with this. I guess I'm trying to get a rough idea of what the traffic is going to be in and out of the site. Yeah, we, you know, our street maintenance crews, they said they, they operate three Vactor trucks and then they have a contractor like Alaska Storm Water Waste and then they operate three trucks. They said they would make like three trips a day per truck. So um, they operate sometime between May and October, but usually maybe somewhere more like June to August is their um, <clears throat> peak, peak times of use. Uh, so, you know, you might get something like 20 trucks or, or you know, more a day uh, hauling it in. Okay. Um, but then after you're hauling it out, you have significantly less waste because it's dewatered, hauling it out. Uh, I estimated uh, from their records, they said they've uh, hauled out like 300 to 700 tons different that, you know, they've had like seven years of data, 300 to seven, 700 was their, you know, largest amount of data or uh, tonnage, you know, and so 70, seven, 700 could be, you know, 70 trucks leaving in two weeks, hauling it out, you know, so more compressed schedule leaving probably than coming. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask two questions and one here. Why rezone the conservation area and why rezone the Clary property? Just for consistency of, of use? Well, kind of uses, or? you know, the, the land use plan map show those as industrial. Um, we bought the two properties together. The city brought the two properties together. I think we're just consistently handling it together. Um, the Clary's seemed interested. They probably recognize that uh, there is no opportunity to develop it as residential. So, um, given the opportunities that they're seeing of, of you know, maybe having access now, I, I can't speak for them, but we did invite them. And then for us, we just own the two, so we went ahead and did both of them. Okay. Treat them the same, especially it will be consistent with the land use plan map. Okay. Uh, one more question to the chair, uh, if I may. There are some settling ponds or some kind of wet areas to the north of the snow storage site. Do you, can you tell us what those are? You know, I don't really know if it has something to do with the snow disposal site or not. But, you know, once the snow disposal, once the snow melts, it has to go somewhere. So it's probably part of its, its treatment before it's, you know, uh, part, part of the treatment, just probably the natural treatment. I, I don't know all the details, but it is on the same site. I'm, I'm assuming it has, you know, there's a lot of water, snow melt that comes off of it. it has to be managed and going somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spring, then Mr. Spinelli. Uh, yeah, real quick question. Um, <clears throat> though, so there'll be some um, basically uh, sediment on site what, how does uh, typically um, prevent um, reentrainment of the sediment in the air, high winds and whatever? Is there something that you do to well stop, prevent that? You know, there's different things that we've seen that have been used down in the lower 48. They use a lot of these concrete blocks that they they can build up and reconstruct and move them around as, as kind of like uh, uh, barrier blocks. Uh, kind of retainage, you know, that's one way that they kind of uh, push them around. But um, mostly, um, you know, it's, it's, it's getting the water out of it. And one of the sites that we saw actually had kind of these stop logs of different places to slow the water down in, in a channel. And, you know, Dewatering it, it just takes time and, and having the proper slope and having a canopy and keeping it dry is, is, is one way. And just one other question to the chair regarding the um, oil and grit separation material. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's um, 
volatile organic compounds that are on the site or in the water? Is is that true? Is that and how you typically treat that? How? Well, you know, it's from all the tests of the waste characterization tests that we've taken so far in sampling, nothing is exceeding, you know, regulatory limits you know, as far as the concentrations of it. Yes, there's there's trace VOCs in this waste waste stream at some point, but um, there's going to be different hoppers for different waste streams. Like what we pull out of the OGS, the oil and grit separators probably going to be handled in a separate bay than, than maybe just the catch basin waste. And, and but, it's treated somehow and contained on But again, it's and... all going to be, you know, managed so that it's dewatered. Oh, good thing to point out. The, the uh, discharge that's dewatered is actually proposed to be entered into the sanitary sewer. So it will be, that's something that we would have to um, get a discharge permit with AWW. So that it will be managed and handled, you know, ultimately at uh, Warren's, you know, point, Warren's off plant. And, and just so that we don't talk about a very conceptual development at this point, rather yeah. than a rezone, I, I guess I would add that you have in front of you a proposed ordinance that deals with those specific uses and, and how you deal with it. So I just would maybe direct you to that as I, well. I was just taking advantage of her expertise. I'm not sure she'll be here for that particular order. Very good. You're double dipping then. Uh, Mr. Spinelli, then Ms. Barker, then I'd love to get to a public hearing. Uh, yeah, through the chair, is there a reason that you don't access the 96th Avenue right away? Yes. Um, my understanding is, is that's not acceptable access from C Street. There's restricted access from that type of corridor. Right now, there is limited um, maintenance access that uh, is gated, and that's just so that maintenance crews can go in and check those sedimentation ponds, and there's a weir there, Thank but you. it's one, not proposed for. One more quick one. Have, have you approached the Corps of Engineers about what I'm assuming is a lot of fill in the wetlands? With what? A lot of fill in the wetlands. Yes, yes, we are talking. We, we've we already submitted, that was in um, Ms. Ferguson's report, we've already submitted, submitted a core application. Okay. Um, it's under public notice right now. All right, thank you. So. That's all. Uh, Ms. Barker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what's the consequence of the no project alternative? This is a requirement uh, for the city to come up with a... Uh, a site to manage this waste stream. You know, it's right now street maintenance is using uh, Northwood site and it's it's not appropriately designed to handle and uh, the amount of materials that we're doing and we want to manage it appropriately. And, you know, that's why we're doing the research that we're doing by going down to lower 48 and looking at the pros and cons of what works and what doesn't work and how best to, you know, manage this type of a facility. So we need a place and we did do a site selection. You know, we started off with a big GIS map of all the different potential properties and narrowed it down and, and we do feel that this is the best, in, you know, one of the best facilities, locations that it can be. What happens if we don't comply with the requirement? I'm just trying to increase our understanding of the whole, whole construct here. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I have Christy Bischoff Berger. She's um, the head of our um, <clears throat> uh, wet, not wetlands, but uh, watershed. Thank you, watershed group. And you know, right now we're already strained in in our obligations. I think we've said. We need to come up with a site within five years of signing, and, and we're close to not even, I don't know. We've got obligations, put it that way. Like right now, that was our, you know, using this Northwood site, asking AWW to go to their site and, and drop off discharge when we can. Those are kind of the best we can do at the moment. Um, we've actually received a letter from AWW, AWW a couple years ago that says, um, you guys got to go find your own site. You know, we just, we don't want to handle the potential grit that's going to enter our system. 
Mr. Chair, maybe we can just go on to the public hearing. If I want to come back to this, we can. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Hu, thank you. You have six minutes for rebuttal. We'll see if anyone has any public testimony. So stay close. Anyone wishing to testify on this case here this evening? Come on forward, please, ma'am. Might need to move that mic over and uh, please state your name for the record. My name is Coco Miquel, and I live on the 92nd Avenue. Can you spell your last name for us? Miquel, M-I-K-E-L. First name is Coco, K-O-K-O. -K -O. Thank you. And I was not planning to do this, but uh, after I listened to those explanations, um, anyway, I, I have a concern of this project. I take my dog for a walk to this area. It's a beautiful wild nature and uh, very peaceful and it's a really bog land and sometimes uh, there's a pond next door to this area a very small pond I think it's something to do with AWW but um, I can see those many wildlife there moose and um, migratory birds swans and sunlit cranes, geese, and ducks. And my concern is if this project goes ahead, it might interfere the quality of the water and the area and ecosystem. And that would be a pity because this is only the one, a few, one of the few places in Anchorage Bowl which obtains a beautiful nature. So I really want you to consider about this Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Anyone else wishing to testify? Anyone at all? Uh, seeing none, I'd invite the petitioner back. If, you, if there's anything you'd like to add or if there's other questions, uh, you've got plenty of time. My name is Christy Bischoffberger. I'm watershed manager for Anchorage. The pond that was referred to, uh, I think it was a question through the chair and also from testimony, is actually a constructed wetland to manage the water from the snow disposal site. So it's actually something that we maintain and we do try to keep it looking good and I'm glad that it's an amenity to the neighborhood, but it is actually a stormwater management facility. Great. Um, thank you. And I guess I would just ask if there's any uh, rebuttal to the testimony that you heard here this evening or add a question as to whether the municipality has any designs on its wetland, uh, particularly to the north of here, ever being open for public access or not. And there's one other question for you in the queue. You know, like right now, whether this parcel to the north is used as mitigation for this site or it may even come into play on mitigation for 100th Avenue, but it's fully the intent to make it a, a conservation easement. And um, the cities with HLB, um, you know, we intend to actually, you know, with all the other various properties that we own, we've there's lands that have been, the smaller residential properties have been donated or we've purchased, um, you know, so between that parcel to the north and some of these, the other various parcels, it's all the intent to make those conservation easements. You know, I don't think we're going to restrict anybody from using it if it's, there's, there's no reason for us to fence it or anything. It'll just be on record document. Great. Thank you. I have one, one other question for you, Mr. Strike. Go ahead. Thank you, and to the chair. And this is kind of follow up to the question from your co worker. Mm -hmm. And this was Can the two sites complement each other? You've got one that's used for the water runoff, you said, through the snow removal. Well, it's not being used in the wintertime. So you've got a large site here already in place handling sediment, sedimentation and runoff. And 
the other one is you don't need the access for the from the snow removal side and the winter it seems like these two sites might be combined yeah to a facility type that's already half built half in place yeah that's a good observation um, we do feel that these are very complementary you know public facilities <clears throat> whether they can actually be used you know sometimes people say oh gosh the snow if on a heavy year that may not melt until you know later in the season do you know more about that we did consider that in fact that was my first choice when we were going down this road however we have snow years like we had a few years ago where the snow actually was still in the snow disposal site when it was getting ready to snow again so we can't depend on that and the other thing is we we set the snow disposal sites up to melt and drain in a particular way they're not accidental and what we need for the disposal site for the OGS and catch basin waste is an entirely different kind of setup. Now, if the site were large enough and we could have both of them side by side, that would be great. And then we could use the constructed wetlands and everything else. But we had to let go of that in order to meet the compliance deadline for this particular mandate. So we started looking around for sites and this particular one is what we landed on. So both sites will, will generate water runoff that will intend to go into the AWW system? Well, no, the, the snow disposal site drains into the constructed wetlands and then ultimately into uh, Campbell Lake. The OGS catch basin waste stream will go to AWU. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Are there any planned uh, s mitigation steps or BMPs that will be in place? And I, this is probably a good question for you um, that will um, mitigate any potential runoff from the, around the boundaries of the site. Like are you gonna leave green space at the boundaries? Or is there going to be, I know with these snow dump sites, they require berms to, you know, basically act as a BMP to keep the moisture on site, that kind of thing? Through the chair, yes, the design will consider all of those things. We don't have the design in place yet to share with you, but we will make sure that the there's a buffer and a protection zone and, and also any kind of catchment that would be required for a system like this. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Strike, and then hopefully we can okay, put this, something on the table. This is for staff because that raises the question. You have industrial land now adjoining residential. Is there a buffer zone requirement between these two zoning areas? There is no street, there is no plat, is there a what type of buffer zone do we look at? Because is this gonna become, I was here first, you take it as it is, or are we gonna create a demarcation zone, a buffer zone between the residential and industrial? The, the, oh, go ahead. Through the chair to uh, Commissioner Strike, the, uh, there actually will be a buffer zone along that portion of it, but I would also note that the residential area that's there is purely a paper plat. It will virtually never develop as residential. It will be, in fact, even now, Heritage Land Bank is buying up many of those parcels uh, to relieve the owners of those paper plats from the property taxes that are associated with them. So they, they are wetland, it is a wetland area. It's highly unlikely it'll ever develop as residential land. And additionally, there is a requirement uh, under new Title 21 of a significant buffer area between uh, I-2 lands and adjacent residential. So, so who, who did you say was buying up this land? Heritage Land Bank. The Heritage Land Bank, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, the public hearing is closed. What's the wish of the body? Mr. Spring. Yes, I move to appro uh, recommend approval of the rezone of approximately 19.01 acres from R1 
district uh, I to heavy industrial district. Thank you, Mr. Spring. Seconded by Mr. Cage. Go ahead. Yes, I find that um, I'm going to support the motion. Um, <clears throat> the rezone um, does not have any major conflicts with the uh, surrounding properties, and particularly the R I R1 zone land to the west, which is, according to staff and my understanding, that is not able to be developed due to severe uh, wetland constraint. Um, and second, that the uh, MOA industrial land use study shows a shortage of, um, a severe shortage of industrially zoned land um, within the Anchorage Bowl in particular. And that the rezone meets the standards of a rezoning um, with the caveat or understanding that the access uh, to the lot will not be uh, a, a simple driveway access as stated in the staff report and that it will meet the um, taking consideration that the uh, Arctic Boulevard right away is uh, classified as a class one collector. Thank you, Mr. Spring. Any additional comments? Mr. Strike. Yes, I'm, I will also be supporting the motion, but I would also I like to identify, because this came up in this last week, that we have two petitioners making two requests for rezoning. And I think it should be either noted that we are intentionally voting to approve both concurrently as opposed to separate motions. Yeah, I, um, is the intent that we have one motion that carries both? Or does, does the uh, the other, the, we have the authority to act as the petitioner, the municipality does on behalf of the other? Because there are two separate and distinct petitioners. There are two petitioners here, but in fact, a rezone is independent of petitioners, to be honest. In, for example, if, if 51, if the municipality were looking to rezone an area specifically, if 51% of the people in that zone uh, agree to it, then it's re it's re the entire zone is rezoned, even though there may be people opposed to it. In this case, all petitioners are in favor of it. The, the rezone is a rezone of its own action. It is not a rezone that's dependent upon indiv individual petitioners. I, I just didn't want this to come back on us later. Yep. Oh, thank you, Mr. Strike. Any, anything else? Mr. Kange. Thank you, through the chair. I'd just like to add the findings that the I-2 zoning designation is appropriate for the areas. It maintains the industrial land use pattern as established and for and in support of the Anchorage 2020 Comprehensive Plan and the draft land use plan map. Thank you, Mr. Kange. And I, too, will support the rezone. I do want to note that we heard um, one member of the public testify this evening uh, opposed. Uh, I believe that the additional wetlands in the area does provide uh, for significant uh, wetland and uh, uh, wildlife habitat. And importantly, I think the proposed use of uh, this lot that's really driving the rezone is extremely important to the overall municipality of Anchorage. Um, and with that, please vote. And that rezoning is approved or recommended for approval to the assembly. Um, hoping we can keep on going unless people really need a break, but we'll, we'll have at it. Case 2016-0101, an ordinance amending Anchorage Municipal Code, Title 21, uh, various uh, uh, sections, uh, text amendments, table of allowed uses to add duplexes and allowed use in the R4 district. Uh, a proposal to allow larger garages on larger lots, to allow private aircraft hangars at legal airstrips, and to establish minimum area required uh, and the method for measuring window area. Um, could we have a staff report, please? Uh, through the chair to the commission, um, as staff on this particular uh, case, I would like to note that uh, we have a, we've been now working with Title 21 for about nine months, and uh, it it really came into consistent use at the beginning of this year, 2016. And there are a number of things that have uh, have come up uh, that have both caught us off guard, and things that we knew that were actually in code that we were going to have to address as we move forward. So we're now trying to identify those as we go along. We're trying to group them into reasonable size packages without 
maybe too many, but also not trying to bring them forward as one piece at a time and to begin addressing them. So I will go ahead and, and start at the beginning of this one. The first portion of the, this uh, code amendment has to do with the text amendments themselves. And that's that the code was originally intended to go into effect on January 1 of 2014. Um, it was put off for a year, then it was given an allowance of going concurrently. You could use new Title 21 or you could use the old Title 21 for the year of 2015. And it's come into full force in 2016. So really we've only had nine months of testing on this code at this point. But the text amendment section essentially uh, had two items in it that were key to, how, to, to being able to address changes as they came up. The first one was that code amendments would only come forward twice a year. In other words, you, two times a year you could bring code amendments forward to the assembly or to, through the planning and zoning commission to the assembly. And I think it was in the intent of that was that the, the frequency of those code amendments wouldn't be such that, that that would be a big deal. And they allowed for three years for that to go on from 2014 through 2017 or into 2000, through, through two, 2014, 15, and 16. So that would have finished on, in January of 2017. So our original intent was to simply make it so that that three years was ongoing. So given that this is the first year we've really had it fully enforced, it would go for uh, three years, in which case that would go through uh, 2000, 16, 17, through, it would basically it would end on January 1 of 2019. But then others noted that, you know, under old Title 21, there was no such provision for only coming two times a year, and, and it really wasn't, it just wasn't a big deal. Well, there wasn't a real reason that anyone could really come up with why that was really an important thing. And so what you see in there now is it basically deletes that requirement to only come two times a year and it allows us to address them as they come up. And, and I would note that this has been really important. We've now had a couple cases where, where for example, uh, ANTHC, where failure to have acted on a code problem would have postponed construction for an entire year and it would have been a multi-million dollar mistake based on an error in Title 21. Uh, we're dealing with one right now on UAA, but it's, it's all over is that the new code simply failed to allow for the fact that PLI lands or uses on PLI lands had storage needs. So for example, UAA doesn't, it's not an allowed use to have a storage area for a hospital or for schools or for universities or even for us. So for example, the bus barn, the school bus barn at, out by the public works area, that's not a legal use under new Title 21. So. We've identified a number of these things that just have to get taken care of and move forward. Um, one, of the, one of the other pieces then is that the assembly had the ability for kind of emergency situations that were clearly identified as mistakes to act on that independently of the Planning and Zoning Commission. And that would be uh, terminated now on January 1 of 2017 after really only one year of being in place. And we'd like to extend that for the original intent of another two years so that it would be in place for three years. It's my goal to bring all of these changes to you. And in fact, there's, I think, a good example of an, one that you could identify as simply a mistake. And that's the, the R2, or the, the duplex in an R4 zone is, is fairly clearly just a mistake that could go directly to the assembly. But these things do have planning implications and by coming both to the Planning and Zoning Commission and to the, the Assembly, there are two public hearings that the public has an opportunity to participate in, so to deal with these things. And we can air them out a little bit more clearly, I think, by addressing it this way. So that addresses the two uh, um, uh, changes to, to uh, the text amendments for Title 21. So, the next one that you see in there is uh, the uh, ability to allow um, duplexes in an R4 zone. 
when Title 21 was first undertaken, that was not, it, both the uh, single family and duplex were not allowed in the R4. But through the public process, it became clear that those two were desirable in that R4 zone. And when you read the purpose in that R4 zone now, you'll see that it's predominantly intended for higher density homes, but it includes single family and duplexes and triplexes. And when you go to the table, however, you'll notice that the, the, that the P that allows that to be an allowed use in that zone is absence. So this is a simple correction to uh, address that. Single family, they are, that is an allowed use in the zone. It was picked up, but the P is missing for the duplexes. Um, the next item then is uh, the garages and carports. And this has been raised by a number of people in the community since new Title 21 was implemented. And the issue that's associated with that is that under old Title 21, you could have a garage or a carport equivalent to 100% of the principal use on the site, not principal structure. So it, didn't, it doesn't equate exactly, and it was always a little difficult to actually figure that out. But what, what we have found is that there are a number of users in the community who'd like to have the larger garages that were allowed under old Title 21. And one of the principal, one of the ideas of, of, of making it so that you couldn't have larger garages was an underlying concern that people might use them for illegal home occupations. And <clears throat> what we find is that there are a lot of people who have home shops, who are car collectors, who are any number of things, who legally have been wanting to have these larger garages, and that the, the real um, uh, frequency of, of illegal use, it, it, we went for decades with the old garages at the size that they were, and it just hasn't been that common. If there's an illegal use, there's another avenue to address that, and that's through code compliance. So we've, we've modified these. Um, the larger garages aren't allowed in all of the zones in the community. They are allowed on larger lots. Smaller lots maintain the uh, requirement for the 50% uh, uh, use or, or maintain that, especially higher density. The, the uh, R2M, R3, R4 all maintain the, the newer requirements for smaller garages. So, for example, if you build your single family or home on those, uh, those lots designed for higher density, you do have to comply with the, small re the requirement for the smaller garages. Um, so those are, those are changes that were brought forward based on uh, a number of people who've come to us over the course of this nine months now. Uh, identifying what their uses are and why it's important to them and, and We've had to take a close look to see you know, what is the impact of the community of having these. We've had them for a long time, and it's our desire to continue to allow them in the larger lots. The next item, then, is it carry the case of aircraft hangars, private residential. And old code never addressed this. Uh, there was a policy that was put in place, but under old code, uh, a lot of the things that were identified as problems never were brought forward to actually be corrected by the within code. They simply got policy changes that got sort of deeper and deeper uh, where yeah, virtually had to have almost a separate book to be able to follow all of the policy changes that had modified Title 21 of old Title 21. So it's really our goal to try to get as many of these things firmly placed into Title 21, so it's clear to everybody what they are. So the hangers is just one that was overlooked. It, it follows exactly the policy that's been in place for the municipality now for a number of years. It simply codifies it in Title 21. Um, so then we get into the standards for windows, and those have probably been one of the more controversial changes to Title 21 that we've dealt with in the past nine months. And we went back out to, to take a really close look. In fact, we surveyed 60 homes in different neighborhoods of Anchorage just to test what do homes have for uh, window areas. And what we found is that the older and the larger homes tend to be just fine. They meet the 15% requirement. 
not always, but most frequently. Uh, you have a number of examples in your packet, but even those are a fraction of all of the ones that we look at. And what we found were the quantity of, of windows didn't necessarily correspond to the aesthetics of the home. You could have a house that didn't look all that great, that had a lot of windows, and vice versa. You, uh, we also found that one of the desires was the idea to uh, place, uh, have as many windows on the street for the sake of general security for the community. And what we found on that is that th there's really not a lot of documented evidence that that improves security. Um, a variety of different uh, reports that are out there uh, that talk about neighborhood security, n none of them identify this as a means of actually achieving that. And I think to look at it maybe in a, in a different way, if you look around Anchorage at the neighborhoods that have uh, the narrow lots that, that have fewer windows, they, they typically have fewer crimes actually than, than neighborhood, older neighborhoods that may have higher percentages of windows that, that are available to the street. I don't say that, that that corresponds exactly, but that's really just the point, is that there are a lot of things that contribute to neighborhood security, and the presence of windows is only one and perhaps a minor one at that. So the thing that windows really impacts is affordable houses for entry-level people, is that to make affordable houses, we have to develop narrow lot designs. And within those narrow lot designs, for the homes to be marketable in Anchorage, they really have to have two-car garages. And when you have a narrow lot and a two-car garage, you cannot get many windows onto it. And so that's one of the things we tried to address. Um, there's a, lot, a great deal, I think, of a great deal more evidence now than at the time Title 21 was being written on the impacts of regulation on the, the cost on home prices. And it's really pretty clearly documented. It can range from 25, 26% of the cost in some cases to even more, in, depending on the city that you're in. So the impact of our regulations on the affordable homes, which are very clearly identified in the comprehensive plan as being desirable, the need for developing narrow lot sites, the need for um, developing affordable homes, is very closely related to the ability to build homes on narrow lots, which impacts windows. So what we did was we dropped it back to what was already determined by, uh, by the assembly earlier this year. We've maintained it at the 10%, but we've provided for a 7% one for very narrow homes. Uh, and we've added requirements for other things like trim and, and uh, paint color, changes in color, changes in texture and trim, as an example, to address some of those situations. So with that, um, I'd be open to any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions uh, for Mr. Stronthal? Any questions at all before I go to public hearing? Mr. Spring. Yeah, thank you. Um, on page six, um, there's discussion in the staff packet about H, narrow lot, small home reduction, um, the window size, uh, let's see, can be reduced to 7%, <clears throat> provided the homes with 500 square feet or less. Do I, I don't understand how that's calculated. 500 square feet, it sounds like a lot to me. It doesn't sound like a narrow lot. You um, calculate the, um, square feet facing the street by the new definition, which is from the, the sill plate to the top plate, right? Say that's, I don't know, would it, it could be 10 feet, I suppose, but probably more like eight feet, and I'm not a builder. So, but if it's 10 feet, that would be 50 feet, it would be um, the width of the, of the house. So 10 by 50 would be 500 square feet. 50 is not a narrow lot. I don't understand, am I miscalculating it or what? What's the problem here? I do not believe that you're miscalculating that. I mean, I, I think that it is a, a still 
probably a reasonable size home. It's a single family, one level home. Um, the, the quantity that we came up with it was one produced through kind of a committee of, of people attempting to uh, arrive at the right number. So I would, I guess I could open that one up, but I still think that at, at 500 square feet, we would, we would end up being. <laughs> Seems to me through the chair that that just basically reduces all single family homes in a standard subdivision to 7%. I wouldn't call it narrow lot. As soon as you get into reduction. a two-story two home, though, I think you would be beyond that. Uh, that's true. But if I could just piggyback, we're not talking about the lots at all. We're just there's nothing that defines the lot in that in that statement. It's just the percentage. It's just the facade itself. That's how I. Well, it say. says narrow lot. Yeah, but it doesn't define small home, narrow lot. Small home reduction and. I just you don't you believe that that's a narrow lot? No, I just put? if it's if it's for narrow lots, we got to say what the lot is, not what the the building is. That's well, just my it's, it's by definition not going to be a, a, a narrow lot if it's 500 square foot is the requirement. Uh, I just think it's going to be it's just basically we might as well say let's just be honest. If you want to reduce it to seven percent on a single family standard ranch home, let's do it. But Let's not make an exception that it's a small lot or a narrow lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, frankly, I think all of this is reducing it to the point where even, frankly, having to read all this is is wasted energy for what the end result is. Well, I don't disagree with the analysis, and I like the photos and everything, and I think it's very interesting. But also, one other follow-up question to the chair. Sure. Um, the last sentence says additional requirements apply for variation in materials, trim, and articulation. Additional requirements. So, is that in this ordinance, or is that going to be delivered separately? It's in code right now. Oh, it's in the code right now. Okay, and that's the twenty one oh seven one one zero D four C then. Okay. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? before we go to public testimony. Uh, I have a feeling there will be some afterwards, but uh, seeing none, I'd like to open uh, the meeting up to public testimony, remind people to, to state and spell your name uh, for the record, and if you're an individual, you get three minutes. If you're representing a specific group, you get five. Pardon me. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Coffey. It seems like I've devoted a good half of my life to Title 21. Uh, I wanted to say that I really appreciate the opportunities that you're going to afford for amendments and changes as we discover these things. And I also compliment staff on bringing you basically three or four. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's in a sizable where you can you can deal with it and address it, and it'll go to the assembly. The idea of the limitation was something I opposed. It should never have been limited. And then when we lost two years for the opportunity, now we're, we're restoring that and allowing these to come more frequently. I think that's, that's, that's just really, really critical. And then you can get in the debate on the, on the substance of the particular things being brought forward, but you're not so limited that we can't even address them. So I, I very much favor that. I also read the public comments. and. Uh, one of them said that th there's no guarantee of a public hearing in uh, the co uh, uh, under the under the code. Well, you're not adopting an ordinance. You or the assembly is not adopting an ordinance without a public hearing, and you aren't going to make recommendations without a public hearing. So I'm not quite sure where that came from, but uh, it was indicia of a, of a lack of understanding of this process. Um, and I will say one last thing. The, the things like the size of the windows and these other issues, the garages and all that, those were all discussed for years and years and years, literally, at numerous Title 21 committee meetings and by, by this body, which has revisited the code and the drafting of the code many, many times. So there's, I, I can't imagine that anyone is uninformed. There may be disagreement about what people think is appropriate, and th there was, if you read the, uh, uh, the, the ones from... Uh, Airport Heights, they were worried about the security questions with the window size and so on and so forth. But the, uh, I agree with Terry and, and the staff that the, 
the, the most important thing on the window size is, is it something that's going to be a heat pump or is it going to be something that's going to put a lot of cold air, cold air into the house? So uh, I urge you to support these things and bring it on and, and I'll be at the assembly meeting um, when they come up and I will again urge them to adopt them and whatever. So I thank you for your time and your service. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Karen Kasich Michelson. I'm a home builder and a residential designer, and I'm also um, representing the Home Builders Association. Um, we've spent a lot of time working with staff, who has just been fantastic on hearing our point of view for as both home builders and home designers um, to make these few changes. So uh, we will continue to work together with staff uh, all through the rest of this year and hopefully the next. And continue to tweak the small portions of Title 21 that are just either mistakes or oversights. So we appreciate your support and uh, hope you'll agree with all of these and move them through for us. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chair, fellow members of the board, my name is Paul Michelson, M-I-C-H-E-L-S-O-H-N. Been a general contractor in Anchorage for approximately 40, 43 years. I commend the work that Mr. Uh, that Terry and the volunteers of the, of the industry have come combined together to make changes in Title 21 better. We uh, have been sitting on the board of uh, Anchorage Home Builders for approximately 18 years, uh, been a member of the Billing Board of Appeals and Adjustments for the City of Anchorage and currently sit on the Bidding Review Board for the City of Anchorage. And when the Title 21, as Mr. Coffey stated, was uh, put together, we in the industry knew that there would be challenges and changes needed in the future. And Mrs. Uh, Schoenthal, Schoenthal has come together with volunteers from the industry and they've combined together and they've created changes that I think are much needed in the industry and I think they're going to make it a better uh, code to work with and adopt and I, I recommend that you approve the changes that have been presented to you tonight and I think uh, we move forward and work together and it's going to be a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. M Mr. Michelson, while, while you're there, could you, could you speak to kind of where the, you know, we heard the question earlier about the narrow lot or the small, could you speak to the 500 square foot number? And the 500 square foot, the way I understand it, is the facade of the house. It's the area of the front of the house. A 50 foot lot is, in, in my opinion, is a narrow lot. Uh, built on lots that are 35 feet wide, 40 feet wide, and they're really narrow. But when you get a 500, a 50 foot wide lot, it's just teetering on narrowness but what they're talking about the 500 square foot is the width and the height of the facade excluding am i correct the gable end excluding the gable end of the house so that's where your 500 square foot comes into effect so it's seven percent of the facade of the house and you you have a sense of um I mean, that's how I understood it as well. But do you have, you know, again, 500, what's a 500, what's a, what, where the elevation of the front of the house is 500 square feet, notwithstanding the gable or however the cat, like what, what kind of house is that? What are we talking about? If, it, if it's a ranch, it'd be a very narrow ranch, but a very long ranch. If it's a two story, you probably have, uh, we can do the math, but it's, your, your height is, Right, you probably have about 700 square foot on a ranch, yeah. on a two-story. Oh, okay. And, and on a ranch, you probably have about 450 to 500 square foot of facade on the front. Okay. But it is a narrow lot. It's not. You just, I, I personally was curious as to why we just didn't define the lot, but I presume what that means is in a, in a condominium situation where you really don't have a lot, but you just have a building pad, you're really trying to describe the, the building rather than the That's lot correct. itself. That's correct. I believe that was the intent, but staff can answer that. Okay. Um, thank you for your testimony. Appreciate your time. Uh, hello, my name is John Rankin. I'm a residential designer. And to, it just so happens, if you look on, if you have one of these, on page seven, I designed that for one of the major builders. 
the question was, they were asked by real estate people basically what people were wanting in this particular subdivision. A lot of you folks might be familiar with that particular house. They wanted a two-car garage with a little ranch. And under the, the way the code was re, the rewrite, that wouldn't have, you couldn't do that house, if you can see what page seven is. It's a cute little house. There's a couple of them that are built. And there's other problems, a lot of unintended consequences by the new Title 21, but I thought I'd help that out as being the one that did that. And uh, to take, getting rid of that, uh, you know, to, to, the way they're helping out, uh, Mr. Schoenthal and, and the people have been great working with us, and we have to get this to a point where we can work with the, in the design community and the home building community. That's pretty much all I have to say on this. Sir, uh, one question. Could you spell your last name for us? Rankin, R-A-N-K-I-N. Thank you. And on the, the uh, since you pointed out the, the image that you've provided, so with the windows in the garage and the, the sort of windows in the door and the transom, that, that, does that meet 7% calculation? Yeah, I, think, I didn't figure that out. I just submitted that. No, it's about seven uh, percent. Uh, they they don't allow the windows in the in the garage. They haven't been under the Title Twenty One where they wanted fifteen percent. It wouldn't have couldn't have fallen. You couldn't have named. Well, I, I and I and but, that uh, is one of our amendments. Here is we're we're right. getting rid work. of the omission of counting the garage windows. I believe. Right. But do you know if now counting the garage windows and the door, do you get to seven percent? And if that an example, or is is that your intent, Mr. Schoenthal, by showing that? It is. That's the intent of showing. So that meets seven percent with the transom window and the windows and the doors and the it windows does. in the garage. Right. It does. Okay. And by going to the plate, by count, uh, you know, uh, measuring the the elevation area to the plate from uh, floor to plate, that really helps too. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Hey, my name is uh, Chuck Holman, uh, President of Holman Incorporated. I'm a general contractor. Uh, primarily do residential remodeling, major additions, and occasional custom home. Uh, I support the passage of the proposed changes here. Uh, I've been involved in this for over a decade in meetings, and you know, past assembly people have said the document was poorly written. There's a lot of corrections that need to be made, but too much time and effort's been put into it. We must pass it. We must put it in place. And so we need to retain the ability to make the necessary corrections. Uh, one impact that this new Title 21 has had on my clients on a day to a negative is the limitation of the 50% of the garage. I had a client that wanted to do a 1,100-square-foot garage. Uh, they had a 1,600-square-foot home, so I told them, you're only allowed to have an 800-square-foot garage, and you have to get rid of your storage shed. Uh, we, I ended up giving a proposal to build a 200-square-foot addition to their home so they'd have 1,800 square feet and then do a 900-square-foot garage because uh, they wanted to park their snow machines and four-wheelers inside a garage instead of leaving them out potentially being stolen and, and secured. Uh, I had another client I built a new home for, and when we went in for the land use permit to build his detached garage, we got turned down. Uh, he, and uh, you know, we had to get rid of his storage shed to build his garage, get the permit. And he said, you know, if I'd known this, I would have just built a bigger house. And to require you know people to build a bigger home so they can have the garage that they want, you know, is just wrong. Uh, at a real estate agent that has some R3 property, you know, this isn't part of the ordinance here, but he wanted to build a thousand square foot garage with a thousand square foot condo. These Alaskans have their toys; it's an arctic climate. And they want, the, they got their snow machines, their four wheelers, or they do woodworking and they want a garage to do things in. Yet, if you want a thousand square foot condo now, you got to have a two thousand square foot, I mean, two thousand square foot primary residence to have a thousand square foot. Um, so, I you know, would like to see that change too, but that really doesn't impact me as a contractor, I, you know, but uh, my clients, uh, you know, they do woodworking. Uh, there's a lot of uses for the garage besides car storage. Uh, like I said, people have, you know, just a lot of things in Alaska. And anyways, thank you. Thank you. Could you spell your name for me, sir? H-O-M-A-N. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for your testimony. Anyone else wishing to testify? Good evening. My name is Ron Thompson. Um, 
THOM, PSOM, um, representing I'm the government activities um, co-chair for Anchorage Home Builders, and also I, I uh, consult on the side and bring a lot of uh, permits into the city. Um, this, these changes were not taken lightly by the administration. We've done many hours working with them, pointing solutions, coming together with options to make sure that the language and everything didn't have little subtleties that maybe not catch all these things that we were trying to do and create more problems. So um, in, in working with the staff, both Hal and Terry, um, every other week we've been meeting for almost six, eight months or something like that now, I think, something like that. Um, and that process has been back and forth. And there's been some proposals come forward and say, oh, this would be really cool to kind of try this. But then you get into it and you start really looking at it and say, you can't do that. My background, obviously, some of you may not know, but I was building official for 18 years here in Anchorage. And I've been working at, at, on the government side. Now I'm on the other side. And so, I mean, I understand all those aspects when it comes to uh, the administration having to make sure that these are enforceable and follow up on it and make sure that there's not loopholes developed. So we kind of really went over that and we'd, we'd sit one topic and we'd hit it and we'd hit it for three, four meetings and go over that. And then they, uh, we'd go out into the, the industry or out into the field and Terry did a lot of research going out in the field. We took pictures of buildings. We calculated everything with regard to ones that looked really nice. People have talked about and commented ones that, that may not be, you know, I think that we're tried to be affected by the changes in Title 21. Um, and so we found those as adverse effects that, that were created by some of those changes. And I think this language really helped clean up being able to build, but also be able to, uh, to keep the aspects of what the Title 21 was created. And, and at the end of the day, I think that using it daily, using it with the staff, meeting all the time, um, we've also, uh, you know, on my side coming in, everybody used to always use generalization, say we need to fix this and this is the problem. Well, here we dealt with specific issues and we made the industry give us specific examples and, and some of those pictures were in there and I think that Terry provided a lot of different samples that we did. So it's a process that, that I think has went very well. Um, did everything in there that both sides brought up? I mean, after going through it, some made it, some didn't, so we tried to to get this and we're, we're going to continue that effort to try to put small succinct corrections that help make sure things are clear so they're enforceable that we can design to them and all those type of things. And this was the first process that I think the administration, um, I, I obviously, um, in, in the first one that went just directly to the assembly, we helped um, put that together with uh, an assembly person. In this case, we all felt the same way when we got to this meeting. It needs to come through the normal chain of command. It needs to come through planning and zoning commission. It needs to go to the assembly. So we were definitely um, uh, inter engaged with working with the administration. And I think um, this is a byproduct of a, a, a really clear, precise, corrected fix that we can actually use in the industry and actually I, I believe the city can also enforce it in a way it makes it easy for plan review it makes the questions that have been going on um, be cleaned up and so um, the the big part of I think putting more change possibilities in the future I mean it's not like we're uh, you know we've been working on this for six months and we put one forward so it's not like they're wanting to go every two weeks and you guys see them every couple meetings but the intent is we might run up against those things that we need to get changed, and it might be important to go more than twice a year for the industry to move and also the administration to be able to enforce correctly. So we appreciate the process. We want to follow the process, and, and um, I think that you can tell there's, there's a lot of people that have worked on it that have been spending time, including a member of the assembly that's been in those meetings with us as well, that, um, and they've um, in, interchanged and got... Um, John Wellington has given us a lot of input with regard to the creation of Title 21. So I think it's been a great process and hopefully is a good document that we can move forward and allow the industry to have a little bit clearer path and then the city be able to enforce it pretty cleanly. Great. Thanks, uh, Ron, for your testimony. Anyone else wishing to testify? Anyone at all? Okay. Hearing none, the public hearing is closed. Any uh, questions, additional questions for staff before I ask for a, a motion? 
Go ahead, Mr. Spring. Uh, yeah, just to staff, um, looking through the Title 21, the table of uh, dimensional standards for residential districts, am I correct that all, all the residential districts have at least a minimum of 50 um, feet uh, width, with the exception of R3 and R4, <clears throat> which allows for 35-foot um, widths, I believe. So 30, 35 or so, yeah. Or 20, I guess, in the R4A. Would you could, so given the fact that every uh, every zoning residential zoning district has at least a 50 foot width, would you say that a 50 foot width is a narrow lot? Um, when the thing is, is that uh, about a 50 foot lot is that that's actually pretty standard for our downtown lots. And the thing that's different to me in assessing those is the difference between a two-story home and a one-story home. A one-story ranch on a 50-foot wide lot with five-foot setbacks on either side means it's 40 feet of house frontage. And then the, you subtract the garage door, the, a, a double-wide garage door off of that. And you have, I mean, the garage door comes into the, the overall width area that you're dealing with. But the, under the new, you can add windows into that. Under the old, you could not. In, in other words, you could count windows in the new, under this new system. But garage windows are going to be relatively small. Most people aren't going to want to put windows into a space that simply is going to be a heat sink. So a lot of people have shops. Others in our group actually noted that they probably spend more time in their garages than they do in the, their bedrooms. So the idea that that's not a valid place to look out onto the street might not be appropriate. But th in answer to your question, is a 50-foot width lot a, a narrow lot? It's a pretty standard lot in the inside the community. But it really comes down to single story versus double story. And I think th that there's potentially some wiggle room on taking a look at what, what a, a reasonable width is. Uh, what we're really trying to deal with are the narrower lot homes on this and through the chair I I don't want to just get in, into discussion with you but I, I mean I agree that that's could, I see how that could be a problem and that's a cute little house here and on this narrow lot and it, this picture shows me that is a narrow lot I've seen these houses and this is a 35 foot wide house lot here and it makes sense for this I mean and it, it's particularly since you have design standards and it has to be done I can see that but I just don't see it Applicable to a 50-foot wide lot. I mean, that's my neighborhood. But John, if your if your if your house is 35 feet, it's because it's on a 50-foot wide lot. If your house is 35 feet, it's because it's on a 50 50-foot wide lot. With five-foot setbacks, right? It could be 40 foot. Yeah. Right. This one I'm looking at the picture though. This one's I've seen this. This is not a on a 50 foot lot this looks like a picture of something on a 35 or 40 foot lot on page seven i mean this, i think the intent was to allow something like that to have lo a lower uh, but i think unintended consequence is that you're going to allow a standard subdivision with 50 foot lots to go down to seven percent mm -hmm. and if you're going to do that we should consciously do that and not just let it be an unintended consequence. Yeah, just, I, and I would just ask you also recognize that there's a lot size and then there's a pad size in a condominium project. So your lot means nothing, right? But you're, you have a buildable area. Uh, Mr. Spinelli. I guess I just wanted to uh, kind of point out a couple things for John's benefit is 50 foot wide lot is the average lot width, but in cul-de-sacs you'll off that they, they you know they take the average so you'll end up with 25 foot wide houses so you do and then also in PUD or cluster developments you'll end up with 35 foot lots so you can have skinny houses and then your you know your open space that's um, required by that type of planning so you end up with 35 foot lots and 25 foot wide homes so so that's kind of just one kind of tidbit that maybe you weren't quite considering so, no, it, but that's pretty common, common for us to be common. building on those things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spinelli. Any other questions of staff? What's the will of the body? Mr. Strike. 
I'll go ahead and take a stab at this and I'll read this. Um, on the case of, in the matter of case 2016-0101, Petitioner Municipality of Anchorage, I move for approval on ordinance amending the Anchorage Municipal Code, Title 21, New Code, subsection 21.02.210B-5, Title 21 Text Amendments. 21.05.010 table of allowed uses to add duplex as an allowed use in the R4 district. 21.05.070D.8 to allow larger garages on larger lots. And 21.05.070D.20 to allow private aircraft hangars at legal airstrips and Subsection 21.07.110C.3 to establish minimum areas required and method for measuring window area. I will be supporting the amendments or the motion. Um, I think there's a combination that we have worked to correct unintended consequences, but as well as clarify past intent, which I think addresses Mr. Springs issues um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you Mr. Strike. Your motion seconded by Ms. Barker. Anyone else uh, wishing to comment on the motion? I'm going I'm to break one second and I'm going to ask staff. I, I neglected to say earlier but uh, page 20 section 3 C that's proposed for deletion could you just tell me why um, that flexibility is being removed the reason why the flexibility was being moved is that when we took a look at, at examples of building homes if we were going from 15 percent down to 10 percent it just wasn't there was no no positive reason to add additional drops in, in windows for that. And a second reason for that was that if in fact the, the stated goal of this whole window thing to begin with is for eyes on the street and for aesthetics basically on the street, for our community benefit, then allowing that that window placement could be put on the other side of the house provided you're already providing 15% doesn't make very much sense to us as a community. I mean, you could put more windows on that side if you want to. That's entirely your choice. But to grant a, uh, a, an exception that allows you to take windows from the front to put it on the back side doesn't support any of the basic premises for the, the intent of the ordinance in the first place. And that's why we were considering well, and, doing and that. I, and I am not in a position to offer any kind of amendment here, but I, what I would simply say is your work here with home builders has been primarily geared at single family homes and, and townhouse development, not multifamily. And I have built multifamily where a side of the building is, which is primarily hallways, stairways, um, mechanical and those sorts of things want a larger structure that sometimes it is in fact if you're not putting living on that for example a side of a building along Muldoon Road and and where we have put windows at the ends of hallways but not much else and have not been able to meet 10 percent there and so I would just argue that I think your examples have been towards a certain type of building and because we don't see a lot of multifamily you're maybe not looking at the multifamily developments uh, quite the same way. So um, again, I think I've used that clause before and I've used it because not only did I not get to 15%, but I didn't get to 10%. Um, to the chair, one thing I would note is that there is a clause. The, the reason, one of the reasons why we considered this and we've actually incorporated now into both the single family as well as multifamily is that at the director's option, the director can grant a, a variance from that 10% for one of the facades not facing the street. And the intent there is that in, in our looking at homes around Anchorage, there were almost none. It was almost 0% that where they met the percentage on one street face, they almost never met it on the other. Hmm. 
And it's just the way homes and multifamily buildings are set up. Like you said, there's, stair there's stairways at one end. On single family homes, it's oftentimes the garage that's on the one end of the, the site that might be facing the other street. And there may not be any windows in it at all. In fact, there frequently aren't. But the intent is that with the ability of the director to take a look at that second facade and make a reading, including not having any windows at all, that there's a, there is a, a safety net there to be able to examine exactly the kind okay. of situations you okay. talked about. Thank you, Mr. Schoenthal. I'll be good with that. Um, back to the, to the main motion. And anyone else wishing to uh, comment uh, on the, the main motion? Please vote. And uh, that ordinance passes. I, I, I would like to state that uh, I do appreciate the process through which um, this, uh, this um, amendment has been offered. I think um, you really don't get into the details uh, by reading code until you have a real prod product in front of you. And I think it's good to have multiple parties at the table um, to work through these issues. Um, I do especially support the notion of not limiting um, uh, amendments. I think that if you identify a problem, you ought to fix the problem and not be um, somehow masochistic in the, in the meantime. Um, so uh, with that, uh, this moves on to the assembly for their discussion. Thank you. We'll take a five-minute break before the uh, last ordinance in front of us. I, I'm going to just wait for spring, and then we'll bring the. Um, what what I wanted him to also hear is that you all received a uh, invitation to a work session with the plan or with the assembly on the land use plan map. Could you just make sure that you either accept or or say that you're not available, just so that the city has a count and is aware of what you're doing. It is, uh, I don't have, I don't remember the date, 7th of October, which is a Friday. And, uh, yeah, so the 7th, it just, so staff's having, uh, oh yeah, it says Anchorage 2040 land use plan, that's what it says. I guess it's the 2040 plan on the 2020 plan, but never mind. Um, but it, it just, and generally speaking, Brandon is, kind of, or uh, the staff is having a tough time getting people to respond. If you're like asked about whether you can make it or not or something, just just if you could, you know, respond to those as, as much as you can. Go ahead, Brandon. Uh, do we know if there's going to be burritos? <laughs> Request for burritos. I assume it's a new mo Okay. Uh, last case in front of us, case 2016-0103, uh, Municipality of Anchorage Ordinance Amending Municipal Code, Title 21-2105, Use Regulations to Include Stormwater Sediment Management Facility as newly identified use in Table 21051 and other changes um, as uh, indicated. Could we have a staff report, please? Yes. Uh, to the Chair and, and the Commission, um, staff was originally uh, uh, approached on this by the project management and engineering department. Uh, and the, the, this particular use was, was originally identified uh, in and put into the use designation as um, the a snow storage facility. The problem was that in the end, it, the requirements, the, the use specific requirements that are associated with the snow storage weren't really appropriate to what was going on here. So there was another attempt to try to f identify a use that was really closer to it maybe. And, and in the end, it, it really became apparent that there may be multiple locations where these are located in town, that this is not likely to be the only one and that the, it would be worth our while to establish uh, an actual use category for this specific use, just so that we could uh, address the use specific needs that are associated with it. So it, as you go through what we've identified it, it we've identified it's being allowed in, uh, 
the R5, R6, R7 zones, the B3 zone, and then all of the industrial zones. And it's a conditional use in all of the residential zones that it's in, in the B3 zone. And it is a, a, a site plan approval, administrative site plan approval in the IT zone. So it, the intent is to kind of cut back on the red tape associated with it being situated in, an I, in the industrial zones, but require that just like we do with mineral, ex, you know, with extraction, mineral extraction or natural resource extraction, that sort of facility or snow storage site uh, in, the, in the more um, susceptible zones like the, the, the residential ones, there, there is a requirement for that conditional use. So questions that came up early, you guys worked pretty hard to pin down Melinda Tzu on some of these things, but the questions that were, that had come up were things like buffering and what kind of things can be placed here. And I think she covered a, a considerable amount of that, but as you have the opportunity, I think, to take a look through, um, we provide the definition, and then we provide the use specific standards, including location, minimum lot size for it, um, the, the materials that are allowed to be actually deposited and placed at these locations, uh, and, and it, it withholds the ability, for example, like A. Woody, use anything that's septic or anything that's, uh, um, you know, concrete slurry, any of a variety of things. We really try to maintain it so that this is really addressing that stormwater sediment that sucked up from something like 3,600 catch basins. And uh, we've identified a required setback from, uh, from property boundaries. Uh, the maximum height of, a, of these gravel piles can be 15, but they'll rarely be that high. They generally have kind of a cover that goes over them. The intent is that they'll drain out, but they don't get to be rained on. And uh, the, it provides for the material, the, the runoff to be collected and stored. Uh, or, or at least be uh, um, sent to where it'll be, be uh, remediated. So for example, I think Melinda touched on that, it'll actually go into the sanitary sewer and not in the storm sewer. So the second piece that we've included in this one is another one that came up from pm &E, and that's that under new Title 21, we're required to have the vertical six inch curbs on all of our streets now. Um, and that included the residential cul-de-sacs. And uh, the guys who drive the snow plows came back and said, that's really a big problem in cul-de-sacs. That if you're trying to make those radiuses and it's not clear exactly where the boundary is, that you hook on the edges on the vertical curb where the, the side ramps are to driveways, it's really easy to hook the blade on those and it, causes damage, it would cause damage to the equipment as well as potentially to drivers. So they'd asked if we would take a look at, at allowing the, non, the mountable curb, the roll curb, as most of us probably think of it, which is the, the most common one. I did actually go back and using aerial photography, I identified 154 cul-de-sacs in Anchorage, which is most of them. I bet it's probably 90% of the cul-de-sacs. And of those, only nine actually have attached sidewalks. And the argument for having the vertical curb in the cul-de-sacs is that cars are always just going up over that roll curb and parking on the sidewalks. And in what I found, I didn't find a single case where that actually happens. And I think where the problem really exists is that people pull into those driveways and they're maybe two car deep or whatever and they park over the sidewalk in their driveways and, and that's not a problem that gets fixed by vertical curbs or roll curbs. It, it just has to be enforced that cars don't get to park on the sidewalks. So that's the second piece that's in here, relatively minor, I think, but uh, one that I think is, uh, is not just something that should go to the assembly. The changes like this that come up should be addressed, I think, by the Planning and Zoning Commission. And so we've combined these two. And that's my report. Thank you. And, and uh, Terry, is it is it just is it is it one motion that you're asking for that then? Um, it is one motion. It's one this ordinance, is, even though these are multiple ordinance. actions. Okay, very good, Mr. Walker. 
Uh, in the case of 2016-0103, uh, I move to approve uh, yeah. the with department recommendations, if any. Thank you. I'm going to I'm going to get you to hold that for a second. Uh, just a little formality here. I'd like to open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to testify? Anyone at all? Hearing none, the public hearing is closed. Mr. Walker, your uh, your motion. The point of order, I, I have a question. Uh, I want to ask the staff a question. Okay. Go ahead. Um, staff, uh, on page 7, I want to get out here too, so <laughs> I don't want to prolong this. And it's a good ordinance. It's a good ordinance. But on page 7, um, the screening, um, am I interpreting that right? It says uh, an earthen berm, a site of skewering screening structure, at least six foot feet tall, um, buffer landscaping L2 or some combination of these. <clears throat> Do I, can I interpret that to mean that you can only you only have to put in at a minimum if you wanted to a six foot tall fence? I think the way that this is written now, I think that that is an uh, an accurate statement. I think that the the fence along the property line, however, there's a setback requirement for the the material itself in in this particular case the one that you reviewed tonight you know there's there's existing vegetation but i think that's a valid point that maybe what you need is the the six foot the six foot fence is part of uh the the buffering landscaping the l2 landscaping and and i think that the comma may be the the problem there i'm not sure well it just um it seems to me they aren't equivalent I mean, I, you'd expect if there's a three choice that they'd be equivalent, the berm, buffer I think the, intent, the intent event, there is that the landscaping goes fence. with it. Excuse me? The intent, I believe, is that the landscaping goes with that six-foot fence. Oh, okay. Well, if you'd look into that, I'd be satisfied, I think. Um, second question. Um, the long-range planning recommended that the IAM district uh, be uh, deleted as, uh, as one of the zoning districts permitted with this is permitted. Have you, um, you didn't, that's it's still included in this, so I'm assuming you disagree with that. Um, it, it's one that, that simply didn't get picked up. We actually have a, a new district coming up that's likely to come online for the, which is the AM, which is airport management, in which case it would be appropriate. But we can delete this from the IM one. Uh, it, it's an oversight on our part. Okay, and then the, what about the um, Chugaki River and, and Girdwood zoning districts? I'm assuming they will need this also. Is that, does this ordinance allow the, this um, sediment management uh, it does facility yet, in those it, districts? It does not yet allow those in those districts. We, we've specifically held off from the Girdwood district because they're going to be re starting to a review of their plan this fall. And the part of the intent, even the garages as an example, doesn't, isn't picked up in the, the, the Girdwood area only because I think it's going to be open for discussion down there. And we don't want to in, include something for Girdwood without really getting an opportunity to go down and, and clear it with them through a little longer exercise. What so Chugak Eagle River then to the chair. Chugak Eagle River, there may be a, a need for this. We don't have it in here right now. Most of that material is still brought back to Anchorage. Okay, thank you. Good questions. Thanks, John. Um, Mr. Walker, can you restate your motion? I move to approve case number 2016-0103 uh, as proposed. Thank you. It's seconded by Mr. Strike. Any, any, uh, would you like to speak to your motion? I, I think it's, uh, it seems like a, a reasonable change to make and um, I just you know it, it makes sense and it seems to be consistent with uh, with the best interest of the development community and uh, in this case uh, what well, half of it anyway with um, Kimini's object objectives so. very good any uh, other discussion please vote I would just additionally say that in our discussion with PMA today related to the rezone and conceptual 
uh, stormwater management facility, many of the issues that are provided in this ordinance did contemplate, I think, a lot of the questions that were coming up. So I think it does tend to capture um, most of the potential issues. So with that, uh, that uh, is approved. And uh, Mr. Walker, um, how about a motion to adjourn? Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>